After evading the Trade Federation's blockade, the Nubian Royal Starship headed for Coruscant with Queen Amidala is forced to find hyperdrive parts on the planet of Tatooine. Landing in the outskirts of the settlement of Mos Espa, Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn is accompanied by R2-D2 Jar Jar Binks and the posing handmaiden Queen Amidala. Trudging through the sands to Mos Espa spaceport, Qui-Gon decides to try one of the smaller dealers. Not wishing to be found and to protect the Queen, after sensing a disturbance in the Force, watching a young boy named Anakin Skywalker rush into the shop, Qui-Gon and R2-D2 were guided to the junkyard, featuring the parts to larger vehicles by Watto, the greedy Toydarian dealer. Remarking that he was the only dealer with the parts to their J-327 Nubian Royal Starship's T-14 hyperdrive, he asks the Jedi Master how he was going to pay for the parts. Qui-Gon made an offer for 20,000 Republic Dataris, but the Toydarian would not accept a currency at risk of change. Despite several attempted mind tricks, Watto was resistant, forcing Qui-Gon to rethink and use the upcoming pod race to gain the parts required. But what if Watto had accepted the Republic credits? What would become of Anakin? What effect would it have on Padme? As you're about to discover, Watto is going to change everything. Striding underneath the archway to Watto's junkyard, Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn was skeptical of being able to pay for new parts to the hyperdrive. He knew Toy Darians had strong minds and would not fall for a Jedi mind trick, so he hoped the Republic Dataris would suffice. Discussing the availability of the hyperdrive parts, Watto asks the inevitable question of Qui-Gon's payment. Qui-Gon confidently offered 20,000 Republic Dataris, and to his surprise, Watto accepted the offer. Exchanging the parts with his credits, Qui-Gon headed back to the ship with Padme and R2-D2, the disturbance in the Force still apparent. Before a sandstorm could engulf them, Obi-Wan and R2-D2 repaired the hyperdrive and they flew back to Coruscant. After ensuring the safety of Queen Amidala, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan reported a disturbance in the Force, and the Jedi Council are not so sure, but nonetheless they contact the station Jedi Knight Quinlan Vos. Vos had sensed it too, but the entity had departed from the planet a short time ago, and the Jedi Council began to grow wary. Was it possible that the Sith were returning, or more likely that a Force sensitive had been taken away from them? They decide to wait, as the current priority pertained to the events on Naboo. With the lack of activity in the Senate, Queen Amidala goes to her home planet of Naboo to locate and form an alliance with the Gungans. This leaves Darth Sidious, who is disguised as Senator Palpatine, free to order Newt Gunray to kill the Queen upon her arrival to Naboo. Following the order, he heads to his suite with the aim of contacting his apprentice Darth Maul. Switching on his holo projector, the figure of the hooded Zabrak was missing. Sidious was confused. It should have been a simple mission to track down the starship of Queen Amidala. He needed to reconsider his plan, considering his master Darth Plagueis. Moving to Coruscant's Monument Plaza and Plagueis' apartment in the Kuldani Spires building, Plagueis reveals his suspicions to his apprentice. Having recently had visions of a convergence in the Force, and he orders his apprentice to eliminate Maul. Sidious heads to the last area where he had made contact with Maul, which was in the Outer Rim, but Maul was nowhere to be found. Sidious was displeased at having to leave empty-handed, but on returning to Coruscant, he had another one of his secret conversations with Jedi Master Dooku. Dooku had expressed his displeasure at the Jedi Council, foolishly delving into political matters, wishing to leave the Order. Talking to Plagueis again, Plagueis stated that it was ever more necessary to eliminate Qui-Gon, who was proving to be an unwelcome obstacle to their grand plan. Informing Gunray to prepare for an attack, Sidious made his way to his home planet, his personal goal to evaluate Dooku. The Jedi meanwhile preparing to battle the Trade Federation forces, when Qui-Gon senses something gravely wrong. This was far more severe than what he had felt on Tatooine, and not something the Jedi Council could understand. Talking to his master Dooku, he had agreed, and ignoring the Council made his way to Naboo. Landing in the foothills of Theed to not attract unwanted attention, Dooku soon joined Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan in their protection of the Queen. Entering the ground of the Theed Royal Palace, the Jedi part ways with the Naboo security force, the disturbance in the Force growing closer. Entering a wide corridor, the ominous presence stood in front of them, fully hooded and wordlessly ignited their blades. The dark side user's cackle echoed through the walls of the palace, and little did the Jedi know, they were facing somebody who had been under their noses in Palpatine. The young Obi-Wan is soon outmatched, as he is sent into a stationary M1 starfighter by a force push. 
Obi-Wan gets up, shrugging off the pain of the impact in his right shoulder, launching himself back into the battle. Using his speed, Obi-Wan makes it very quickly to the battle, where he sees that his master was outmatched, yet it seemed the Sith was taking it lightly on the Jedi Master, requiring Dooku to defend a lot more. Once again, Obi-Wan is thoroughly out of place, being pushed back even further than before, almost falling off the entire complex. Obi-Wan staggers to his feet, but from afar he can hear Qui-Gon telling him to stay away. Obi-Wan complies and jumps into one of the idle ships to join the battle against the Trade Federation. Back in the palace, Qui-Gon was trusting his master to bear the brunt of the ferocious attacks as he looked for an alternative solution. Noticing that there was a vast chasm up ahead, Qui-Gon ducked under a flurry of attacks before rolling away. Climbing to an upper balcony, Qui-Gon darted across and made it to the other side enclosing Sidious. The Sith Lord knew he could defeat the two combatants, but contrary to his master, he had other uses for Qui-Gon. In a flash, he had disappeared into the chasm, leaving nothing but a trail of evil. Dooku walks around the thin ledge to help his exhausted Padawan to his feet, both still oblivious to the real identity of the Sith Lord. Dooku was just as confused as Qui-Gon. The Sith Lord could have killed them easily. Making their way to the throne room, they received news that Obi-Wan had managed to destroy the droid control ship, snatching victory from the grasp of the Trade Federation. Arriving back on Coruscant, Obi-Wan is knighted for his efforts, but the Council's biggest concern is the mysterious Sith Lord battled by Dooku and Qui-Gon. Recounting their duel, the Jedi Council are astonished to hear that such a being had been hiding in the shadows. Dooku and Qui-Gon are disappointed by the Jedi Council, failing to heed their prior warnings, as well as their predictable choices, and choose to leave the Order, leaving Obi-Wan. Without Qui-Gon or a Padawan to train, the now shaken belief in the Jedi Order causes the Jedi Knight to lose his way, making him an easy target for the Sith. Before the Jedi Council could arrest the situation, Obi-Wan had left the Order and fell under the control of the Sith. With his careful and calculated tendencies, Obi-Wan drew the attention of Plagueis and away from Sidious, continuing their research on midichlorians. Upon discovering Plagueis and Obi-Wan's work, Sidious' displeasure returns to his greatest height. Not only was Obi-Wan supposed to be his apprentice, but he himself was to complete the Sith Grand Plan. One night after a Senate debate, Sidious decided that his use for his master had long expired. Arriving at Plagueis' apartment, Plagueis was staring into Coruscant's nightscape when Sidious hit him with the full force of a force finding attack. Writhing in pain, Plagueis managed to get enough composure to ignite his lightsaber and take his battle to the outdoors. Knowing that Sidious possessed immense skill in lightsaber combat, Plagueis had to use his knowledge of the force, conjuring up several force illusions. Plagueis is given enough time to escape to the underworld, where Obi-Wan had been on a mission. Obi-Wan is not surprised by Sidious' attack, after all, there could only be two. The two intelligent minds waited patiently on one of the deserted upper levels, before the billowing cape of Sidious floated down nearby. Using their narrow streets to their advantage, Plagueis summons the force illusion of a building, blocking Sidious' path and allowing Obi-Wan to jump in for a surprise attack. Sidious scoffed at Obi-Wan's attacks and the cowardice of his master for not facing him alone, but he was met by a lightsaber in his back. He had underestimated his master and had paid the ultimate price. Soon it was obvious that their fighting had drew attention from other levels of the underworld as alarms began to go off and sirens resonated above. Quickly dashing away, they left the underworld police to solve the demise of the recently elected Chancellor Palpatine. The wound in the back clearly pointed to a lightsaber and the underworld police were quick to summon the help of the Jedi Order. Mace Windu and Yoda both examined the scene looking at how the wound was inflicted, as well as the lightsaber hilts left behind. They were supremely crafted pieces of equipment, and it pointed to a very powerful force user lightsaber duelist. Retrieving Quinlan Voss from Tatooine, he uses his psychometry to determine that Palpatine had wielded these blades whilst dueling. Could this be the key to unlocking the identity of the Sith Lord? Performing a thorough search of Palpatine's new Senate apartment, the walls are decorated with bizarre artifacts, but there are no signs of Sith involvement. The Jedi trudge back to the Jedi Temple, devoid of any further clues, but walking through the archives, the Jedi Temple flares into life as the security alarms begin to scream. The Jedi split up, teaming up with Temple guards to find whatever triggered the alarm. They soon deduce that it was in the Holocron Vault, and Yoda finds that several are missing as he sees a shadow gliding across close by. 
Yodo is quick to react, chasing the shadow through the temple. However, he soon discovered that it was merely an illusion. Reflecting upon being outmaneuvered again, Yodo immediately pointed to Dooku and Qui-Gon taking the holocron. Holding an emergency council meeting, the Jedi cannot find a solution to their recent failings. Whilst the Jedi have been making predictable moves for political motives, the Sith had evolved into a faction to be feared. All these events were not a coincidence, and the Jedi were now one step behind. They hoped their trust in the Force would be enough as a new war begins. The return of war to the Jedi was welcomed by one individual who had just left the world of Tatooine. The Zabrak Maul was now flying in a Sith infiltrator, having ignored his master's orders to kill Padme Amidala, and was now carrying the precious cargo of Anakin Skywalker. After the Jedi had repaired their ship and left the world, Maul left his perch on top of a sand dune and used his blood fin to accelerate to Mos Espa. The Sith didn't need his eyes to spot the Toydarian Watto's workshop, such was the powerful aura generated by the young slave Anakin Skywalker. While Darth Sidious had taught him some diplomacy skills, Maul didn't know how to approach the young Skywalker, and reverted to his best skill of violence. Using the Force to slam Watto into the shop's counter, Maul then pushed Anakin into a wall to knock him out, and casually threw him over his shoulder. Deactivating Anakin's slave tracker with a wand on Watto's belt, Maul moved out of the shop of Mos Espa to hyperspace where he was now, as he continued his course to his old home of Dathomir. Maul knew that Talzin hated Sidious for taking him away, and when the Zabrak descended through the Red Mist, Talzin was waiting with her Night Sisters, having seen visions of his return through a crystal ball. The young Force sensitive carried by Maul was awoken by Talzin, and Anakin looked excited and terrified at being on the new planet. Whilst Talzin had rarely performed rituals on humans, the power and potential of Anakin could not fall to the Sith, and she gathered her fellow Night Sisters for a ritual similar to a baptism. Anakin is lifted into the air by the Night Sisters, then immersed in the water beneath the Night Sister lair, and finally covered in Dathomir's magical icon, sealing his allegiance to Talzin and the Night Sisters. As Anakin started to learn from Maul, Qui-Gon and Dooku were located in Dooku's castle in Sereno, planning for a way to get rid of the Sith without the Jedi. The former Jedi Masters tried to get into contact with Jedi Master Sifo Dyas, who Dooku knew had been working with the Kaminoans, but having lost his trail, they decided to travel to Felucia to find out more. When they arrived to the jungle world, the former Jedi sensed darkness in the jungles, and amongst the nice selling crops, Qui-Gon in particular shocked to see Obi-Wan Kenobi. His former Padawan looked back to the Jedi with a cold darkness, and the Jedi knew that Obi-Wan was just there to delay them from finding the truth of Sifo Dyas. As the native Felucians dangled from the jungle, Obi-Wan used the Force to pull several drooping pods into the Jedi before running back to an old path. Dooku and Qui-Gon were moved, sensing the growing unrest amongst the Felucians, and conclude Obi-Wan had obviously laid traps, so look around for the Felucian leaders who were in allegiance with the Republic. When the Felucian elders see the lightsabers, they immediately know the duo were searching for Sifo Dyas and guide them to the sacred Sarlacc pit known as the Ancient Abyss. At the edge of the Sarlacc pit, Sifo Dyas was calmly meditating in anticipation of an attack, but at the sight of the former Jedi, he stood up and ordered them to leave before Obi-Wan arrived. The former Jedi can hear the Trade Federation ships overhead, and combined with the distant demonic cries of Obi-Wan, they leave for Lucia with the vital Sifo Dyas. The Jedi Master had indeed been working with the Kaminoans, as he foresaw a great war, but since his time on Felucia, his vision had changed to a different threat. After completing negotiations with the Pikes on Obadia, Sifo Dyas guided Dooku and Qui-Gon to Kamino, where the Kaminoans had begun to construct a cloning facility to his needs. Sifo Dyas had secretly organised a deal with the Intergalactic Banking Clan, but the presence of the former Jedi had modified his plans, and now Dooku would be the subject of the clones. Whilst cloning a Force Sensitive would be more expensive, an army of the formidable Jedi Duelist would easily dismantle any Trade Federation or Jedi army. With Obi-Wan showing the threat of the Sith on Felucia, Sifo Dyas needed to accelerate the growth of the clones, and turn to an ancient cloning technology developed by the Comite species. The Sparty Creations factory on the world of Cartel had secretly been making clone cylinders that used flash pumping, which involved using simulations to transfer knowledge to the cerebral cortex of the clone, and the former Jedi combined this with the lizard-like creature known as the Ysalamri to ensure the clones were stabilised. 
The clones would be ready in around 20 standard days, and the sudden threat was felt by both the Sith, but it was Grandmaster Yoda that was most shaken. Recent events had left the Jedi doubting his leadership, and now the peacekeepers of the past millennia would be fighting as warriors, so he gathered the Jedi Council to meditate together. The dark side was clouding their vision, but they foresaw a mighty battle on a number of frontiers, and one that the Jedi would fail to win. Yoda always believed the future was in motion, so after taking some time to meditate alone, he found the Force presence of his old Padawan drawing towards him. The Grand Master decided to secretly leave the temple, then travel to Dooku's homeworld of Sereno to try and establish an alliance, and was not surprised to find his old Padawan waiting for his arrival. Dooku respectfully bowed to Yoda, and as they walked past the pillars to the entrance of his castle, Dooku asked Yoda if the Jedi had realised their errors. As Yoda gently tapped his cane onto the floor, his thoughts were interrupted by a subtle gust above him in the force, and the Grand Master could sense danger amongst the trees that lined the exterior of the castle. Yoda and Dooku remained patient, and silently meditated facing away from each other, until they hear a supernatural roar, then ignited their lightsabers. The Night Brother Maul was completely immersed in Night Sister magic, and flew through the air to attack the Great Masters, and screams from around them told the Jedi they were being ambushed. Even though the air became a smog of green mist, Yoda and Dooku did not need their eyes to see, and they started removing the castle pillars to throw into the Night Sisters. The Night Sisters retaliated by throwing wide-ranging potions and firing darts and energized arrows, but the Jedi combined the ability of breath control and their lightsabers to go to their ships. But as they're about to escape, the entire castle and its surroundings are trapped as a green bubble emitted from the tallest cliff, and it was Mother Talzin. The leader of the Night Sisters had seen the death of Darth Sidious and knew the galaxy would be vulnerable, so had chosen to strike at two of the most powerful beings. As Yoda and Dooku tried to trap Talzin from opposing sides, Yoda saw a horrific sight beside Talzin as she was siphoning the force energy of Anakin Skywalker. Yoda force pulled Anakin away from Talzin's ritual, leaving Dooku to deactivate the bubble by fighting Talzin, and the energy sword clashed with the curved hilted lightsaber. Talzin was outmatched by Dooku's skill, but used her magic to teleport across the area, so Dooku decided to draw into his castle. As Yoda carried Anakin in one hand, and deflected the attacks of the Night Sisters with the other, on the way to his Starfighter, Dooku used his guard droids to delay Talzin, as he made his way to his throne room. The former Jedi asked for Sifo Dias and Qui-Gon, to alert the Jedi and the Kaminoans of the battle, before waiting for the Night Sister. Talzin thought Dooku looked vulnerable, with nowhere to run, and teleported in front of him, only to find that he opened the lift beneath him, sending her falling over a hundred meters to a painful death. Talzin's death turned the screams of the sisters into silence, as they weakened without her magic, and the spell within Anakin was lifted. The attack and near defeat from the Night Sisters made Yoda realize that his leadership of the Jedi was flawed, and he would need to ally with Dooku. Yoda agrees that together they can neutralize the Sith, but just as he is about to enter his ship, he nearly falls to the floor in shock, at the great pain he fell through the force. Yoda activates the small hollow projector in his ship, and together with Dooku, they see Mace Windu deflecting attacks from battle droids, and through a stuttering signal, he reported that Coruscant was under attack from the Sith and the Trade Federation. As Yoda travelled back to the Jedi, Dooku was on his way back to Kamino, where his clones had just been produced, and when he eventually landed, he inspected the now armoured clones of himself, being transported in consular class cruisers. Dooku could feel the power of the clones, but also a great darkness within the Force, as he joined Sifo Dias and Qui-Gon on the way to Coruscant. The three former Jedi had the new clones, and carved through the Trade Federation's blockade that had obstructed all the hyperlanes and trade routes to Coruscant, but the smooth road for the former Jedi would end when they saw Coruscant, with the Sith surrounding the entire planet, using giant cruisers and destroyers. The small landing craft used by Dooku is repeatedly struck by the turbo lasers from the battleships before sustaining permanent damage, and as the ship falls towards one of their own cruisers, the former Jedi used the force to divert the trajectory of the ship into one of the Trade Federation's battleships. Even with the combined might of the three former Jedi Masters, their falling ship doesn't go where they wanted and crash straight into the bridge instead. Dooku, Qui-Gon and Sifo Dias cough through the smoke, and place breathing masks as they see the droids flying out of the airlocks. The pressure from the outside is too much for them to leave the ship, so Dooku uses the force to move the battleship's controls, directing them down to Coruscant. The blazing inferno shot through the world's atmosphere, 
and with the skyline rapidly closing in, the three former Jedi leapt out, landing on the closest building, which happened to be the 500 Republica. The once silent region in and around the Jedi Temple was now filled with chaotic screams of civilians and a field of smoke and death, but the three exiles would not let the Sith walk over the Jedi. With the main battleship destroyed, the clones fly through the hole in the aerial blockade, and Dooku then orders for the landing craft to surround the perimeter of the smoke. The clones all ignited their lightsabers and changed the tide of the battle, demolishing all droids in their path, but the former Jedi find this too easy, so jumped on a landing craft and entered the battle themselves. The presence of the clones stopped Plagueis and Obi-Wan for a moment, but the Sith Lord didn't look phased, and staring directly at the Jedi, he executed Contingency Order 66. Everyone other than the Sith froze into a stunned silence, as the clones all swiveled towards the Jedi, but no one was more surprised than Dooku and Sifo Dyas, who now realised Plagueis flundered the entire project. Almost every Jedi Master and Council member was killed on the spot, unable to resist the army of Dooku's, other than Yoda, who had run to the Jedi Temple's hangar with Anakin. Qui-Gon, Sifo, Dyas and Dooku were consumed by what they thought was their creation, leaving the two Sith of Plagueis and Obi-Wan. The Sith had taken over the Republic's home of Coruscant, and now they would have their own golden era. On the world of Dagobah, Yoda and Anakin were the last hope for the Jedi, but with no outside help, they would be forced to take a similar path to Darth Bane, hiding in the shadows, waiting for the Sith to end. That is it for What If Watto accepted the Republic credits. If you want to see more What Ifs in the future, feel free to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Discord server and Twitter, and leave a comment on what What If you'd like to see next, and how I can improve my videos. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.